Okay, this is uh, Kurt Russell with the uh, Open Mat and Everything Penn State, and uh, we missed our podcast last week, and I'm with uh, Tim Owen again from Blue and White Illustrated. How's it going, Tim? Good, Kurt. How you doing? Good. Um, so we kind of missed a week last week, so why don't we just kind of talk about, real briefly, what happened at Minnesota. You were at the match there, right? Yeah, yeah. We uh, went there last Sunday. For the, actually, the broadcast was live on Big Ten, so a lot of Penn State fans were actually able to see the first live dual meet of the season on national or uh, Big Ten television. Yeah, so what were uh, what were some of the, uh, we know the Penn State lost, so what were some of the high points, some plus points you felt like Penn State could take out of that? Uh, two plus points is, I mean, even though they both were losses, the true freshman, Nico Megalunas and Morgan McIntosh, performed, performed well against two very, two very good competitors, and uh, Zach Sanders and Sonny Young, who are both fifth-year seniors, ranked number two in the country at the time, and they did well. Like I said, they both lost, but Morgan held his own against Sanders. Sanders is just tough to score on, and, uh, and you know, but Morgan saw, him, saw some things that he needs to improve on, and I think there might could be a different outcome, or at least maybe even a closer match if they meet again at the end of the year. And then the match that everyone was talking about, Morgan McIntosh and Sonny Young, that came down literally to the last five seconds of the match. Uh, as everyone saw, I'm sure Morgan was able to get a date down for something like 20 seconds left in the match. And, and then, then Jan, Jan hit that Gramby and got out of it. Yeah, he just exploded out of that. And you know, talking to Cal afterwards, it's just, you know, just one... One more adjustment that Morgan has to make to the next level. Uh, you know, Morgan went through his whole high school career basically dominating opponents on his feet, taking him down, letting him up. So he's still working with that wrestling. It's something Cal mentioned he, the entire team needs to work on. But Morgan's still working on, you know, riding on top, staying in control, even scoring points from the top position. And that's just something that he wasn't able to do with Sonny, especially in their last that third period of that last scramble. Um, the Sonny's so so much more experienced and so much stronger. I mean, Sonny, Sonny's a beast. Uh, but it just that Morgan could hang with Sonny for, you know, the entire seven minutes. And basically, the way, depending on how you look at it, could have won that match. Just really said good things for Morgan and where he stands as a true freshman early in the season. Yeah, so... Um... Yeah, another 15 seconds, he, he may have won that. And um, and honestly, you know, just looking at the team score, um, you know, if if Quentin would have wrestled the way he wrestled against Steinhaus last year, if Morgan would have pulled that out, Penn State could have actually won the, the match. But, you know, they didn't. But there's definitely room to improve there. Um, the one thing, you know, I thought was – uh, maybe a bit disappointing was the f- fact that Frank was winning six nothing, and then the last period, you know, basically wrestled, you know, still beat Ness in the last period, but gave up ten points in the last period and didn't didn't get the major. Yeah, and he had that major right in his hand too, and let it slip right through, and that's all that I talked to Frank with after the match, and he, he understood that, you know, he he uh, had the had the opportunity to get those extra points. Just didn't take advantage of it. And he, he understands that, you know, Dylan Ness is a great wrestler, even though he's young. You know, you got to give him all the credit in the world for keeping keeping with Frank for the entire three periods. Um, Frank admitted that he got a, got a little lax there in the last couple of minutes or last couple of seconds. Um, and Dylan Ness took advantage of it. That's what's going to happen when you're facing a good wrestler, no matter what the age. Uh, I think Frank learned from it, even though that was kind of one of the knocks on him last year, was he had a lot of seven-point victory, especially in the dual meets, that you know, just one more move, he could have given given his team a couple more points for the dual meet, at least one more. Um, so that's something he's working on, that's something Cale Sanderson has addressed with him, and you know, hopefully for Melanero's sake, you know, he gets that fixed here before it's, before it's too late for the dual meets. Did you think that David had Jan pinned? You know, I, I actually was on the, on the side of the mat with uh, my camera for the match, and from my angle, I, I just couldn't come up for, for sure. I mean, a lot of people said he had a pin. David even said he was pinned. Um, just with the route the ref listed, I couldn't, couldn't tell you if he was or not, but from the sounds of it, I think David might, might have had a pin there. But uh, either way, 
I, I saw that um, at 133 you said in your uh, your notes this week that uh, Derek actually sprained his ankle against Thawne. Was that right in the middle of the match? Did that kind of contribute to um, the score there, did he say? Yeah, yeah. If you remember, I believe it was in the second period, my time in the third period. Uh, they had to stop, Matt, stop, stop the match for some injury time on Derek's part. And he just got his foot caught in there, got it twisted up a little bit, and they're called it a high ankle sprain right now. Um, still unclear, actually, if he's actually going to rest someday. If he doesn't, that means Penn State won't even have a 133-pounder going Sunday uh, because Michael Waters is actually going to go 141 from the sounds of it. Uh, but he's getting healthier. Uh, Cal said he'll definitely be ready to, ready to go for their next dual meet in December against uh, Lehigh. And if he, they don't necessarily need him this weekend, so if they feel like they're not going to be able to get 100% out of there, they're probably going to just let him rest Sunday. Got it. Now, um, did you get a chance, chance to talk to uh, Sherlock after the duel? No, I didn't get a chance to talk to Sherlock. He, uh, in the stay in the locker room and, you know, just went, uh, went home with his parents or whatever was waiting for him after the match. But you know, he did, he had another one of the rough matches. And Cal made mention at Tuesday's practice that he's going to use this netting line open to maybe mess around with the roster a little bit, the starting lineup going into the Lehigh match. So if, he, if Sherlock really needs to come out Sunday and he might open and have a solid performance, even though 141 looks that for decent competition, it, from the sounds of it, Cal might not be 100% set on staying at the 141 position or mm-hmm. starting spot. So, you know, if Peter Saw can come out and, you know, maybe have a good tournament, he can be back in the mix at 141, depending. Uh, you know, sure, I'm still young, though. Does he still doing it just about Matt's first sanction the, the college wrestler since he's been pressured last year? But I think it's just a little bit of an adjustment period for him. But, you know, with this, with this team, you don't have a lot of time to, to get acclimated to things because you have guys like Brian Pearsall who are waiting right behind you to take the starting spot. So this Sunday is going to be important for both Sherlock Pearsall. Well, I mean, the kid he wrestled from Minnesota, um, Dardanes, he um, he was a redshirt freshman too. So, you know, I'm uh, personally, I mean, if I was a coach, I wouldn't be cutting Sam any sh- slack about that. But um, that's definitely a, a spot that, you know, the New England Open is going to have to, I think that's smart for him to do something like that. Um, what else do we have up there? I think um, other than that, just, you know, I was wondering what was going on with uh Cam, because he looked like he's put on some weight, but against um, uh, Tony Nelson, he just looked very sluggish. Yeah, Tony, um, Tony Nelson is just, he's a different build than Cameron, obviously, from what you can see. And I think that kind of plays against Cameron, and especially with Tony Nelson, especially that, was, that even showed a little bit last year if you watched the matches. Um, Nelson, Nelson's a strong, strong guy. It's just even though he kind of looks a little smaller than Cameron, um, I think Nelson kind of has the strength advantage between those two, and that kind of showed. Um, Cameron just is there. Is, I don't want to say inconsistent. It's just some guys, some of the guys he can beat will beat the guys that beat him. And, you know, I just think Cameron needs to find his groove, find what works for him, and wrestle with his style rather than trying to trying to acclimate himself to his opponents like like Nelson's style of wrestling which is you know just using his brute strength brute force and even even his quickness because he is one of the uh, more slender I guess heavyweights in, in the Big Ten this year so did you get a chance to talk to Quentin after the Minnesota match <laughs> no Quentin uh, didn't, make, didn't make it available to the media afterwards I think we just had the opportunity to talk to Ed David and Frank uh, and I actually didn't get a chance to talk to Quentin on Tuesday's practice because he, just like he wasn't he wasn't there at first. But I think he was a little upset with his performance. Obviously, I know Cal was to a certain extent. Uh, but it's it's it starting to look a little bit how it started out last year. Is you know Quentin's starting to lose the kids that he's proved that he can beat and he can wrestle with. Uh, and like Cal said, it's just going to be a mentality thing. Get back into the groove of things and. Uh, you know, hopefully for Quentin's sake, it happens sooner rather than later. Uh, the last year, I guess he did show that he can take a few different losses and still come to, come to show up in 
Um, I guess the last thing would be, well, let's see, we talked about Frank and um, with uh, Dylan Alton. He, he actually was even with Jake there after two, and he just seemed to, uh, I hate to even say it, but he looked like he kind of gassed in the third period there against him. So and it, it seems like he needs to really start working a little bit harder on some of his math skills, too. Okay, and the only person we didn't talk about was Ed, but I don't think that even really needs any commentary. The kid he was wrestling was uh, kind of a third-string guy, and, you know, Ed did what he needed to, what he should have done, and there's really not much commentary there as far as I can see. Yeah, it was unfortunate that their first guy there, you know, had the injury, but, you know, just it, that you know, Ed some credit there to take care of business and, you know, not really letting the match go any longer than it needed to be and getting the six points that, you know, Cal expected out of him in that match. And, and that, that cradle, that far side cross age cradle is something that he likes to use. I asked him about it after the match. I said, I said, people even know that's coming, Ed, and you still uh, don't, don't, don't bother, you know, hitting it. And he, uh, he's just keeping the other moves secret for the end of the year. <laughs> and he, he, he said he's got more in the, more in, in his, in his repertoire moves. But for right now, he's just going to show the cradle. So we'll see what else he has coming towards the end of the season. <laughs> right. Now, I wanted to get to the Nittany Line Open, but um, since you work with the guys at Blue and White Illustrated, I thought we'd take a sidestep here and discuss the most probably obvious thing that's going on in Happy Valley these days, and who is going to succeed Joe Paterno. What have you heard? <laughs> oh, I've heard about everything under the sun. <laughs> it's just kind of depending on, you know, what what's fact and what's rumor and, you know, who's just speculate, who's speculating and, you know, what we're hearing is that Penn State's really going to focus on bringing in a big name coach who's going to put fans in the stands because plainly they are not able to, they won't be able to afford to not put at least 107,000 fans in the stands each each week in and out. Uh, so you're hearing a couple of names tossed around, like Chris Peterson of Boise State, Mark Rick of Georgia. Uh, who, who is that from uh, Georgia? Mark Mark Rick? Mark Rick, the Georgia head coach. That's supposedly he uh, has been unhappy with his stay in Georgia over the last year or two and starting to look other places. I mean, and this is uh, we've just heard that he has shown some type of interest. We don't know if he's had an interview or anything like that yet. Uh, we have a couple other guys in the mix. Um, the Harvard coach, Tim Murphy, who has actually done a superb job at Harvard for given the, the limitations that an Ivy League school has. Uh, but he might not be as, as big of a name as some Penn State fans would hope. Yeah. Uh, so you're also still hearing Mike London from Virginia. 
Virginia, uh, David Shaw from Stanford, Gary Patterson from Christian. You know, they're all names that are being tossed around that very well could be a possibility. Um, but like I said, we haven't heard of anyone getting an official interview yet. We've only been able to confirm that Tom Bradley will get the chance to interview. However, we're hearing from a number of sources that um, won't be the coach next year. Uh, but that still just will be, you know, time will tell. And from the sounds of it, we'll find out sooner or later because their Penn State needs to have this in place within the next 10 to 14 days. Uh, the longer it drags on, the, the more it's going to hurt their current recruiting chances and their chance to keep their current players on the roster. Uh, um, so, so I was going to say, what, what have you, uh, what have you heard about, you know, the two names I've heard thrown around also Dan Mullen from Mississippi state and, uh, the other coach, I forget his name from, uh, Vanderbilt. All right. Well, you have, um, Mullen's name's getting tossed around quite a bit and especially down around the Mississippi area. And we're not quite hundred percent sure if he is the leading candidate as some reports have said we've heard uh, different on many occasions we've heard more so that Mullen wants to be Penn State coach more so that Penn State wants Mullen to be the coach that like I said that Mullen will probably still get an interview or at least will be considered um, but I would actually be surprised if Mullen the next coach at Penn State and then you mentioned the Vanderbilt coach who personally I think this might be the dark horse to keep an eye on his name is uh, James Franklin from Vanderbilt and he he is working with Vanderbilt which is obviously an academic school in the middle of the top SEC conference known for the, obviously for the football to look at Alabama and LSU looks like they're going to be a rematch for the national championship so you have Vanderbilt playing in that same conference who is an academic school yeah, they still have to manage to stay afloat in the SEC, and that's what he's done this year as his first year. That making a six and six record, even though two of those wins have come from the SEC, he's been able to keep four of his losses within seven points of the SEC opponents, and that's that's just a huge step for the improvement for a Vanderbilt program that struggled year in and year out for seemingly forever. But he's got good credentials. Uh, he was with Green Bay Packers at one point, uh, Kansas State. He was a Maryland offensive coordinator before taking the Vander- Vanderbilt job. And actually, he got his big break at Maryland from current Penn State linebackers, Ron Vanderland. And, and that's been keep an eye out as if Penn State were to go with Franklin, who's only 39 years old. Uh, you know, it would be, it would make sense. Vanderlinden on the on the coaching staff because he has a relationship with the current recruits and the current players, obviously, but also he has a good really good relationship with Franklin. That it, it is foreseeable that he would keep Vanderlinden on the staff. Right. Well, great. Any other little tidbits to share on that? I think it's just kind of a wait and see now. Uh, like I said, interviews could start as soon as this weekend. And we by this time next week we might even have a coach. You know. Okay, then uh, let's switch back to wrestling in the Nittany Lion Open here. Um, I remember last year at one point there was about 660 entrants on uh, Friday night, but only about half of those uh, showed up, and it seems to be a little bit similar thing going on this year. But um, there are some still pretty intriguing matchups, despite the fact nobody really looks like they're sending their entire first-string team here. So... uh, of course, the one thing everybody's talking about at 165 is we've got uh, David Taylor there and then uh, Abdurk Murov, who's ranked, I think, seventh right now from Clarion, maybe sixth. Servan from... Um, uh, let's see, Servan from... Uh, I think he's from Ryder. He's a two-time qualifier. Steve Fittery, who was pretty much, the, I think, the number one guy at 57 in the rankings almost all year. All of last year, yeah. Yep. And uh, he's going in on an attached uh, Ludowski, uh, Luan Dwowski from uh, Buffalo. I think uh, he's the Mac, current Mac champ. Austin May's older brother, Hunter, who's currently ranked from Boston. And then uh, 
A name uh, a lot of old time guys like me will recognize. Uh, Wade Chalice's son Jacob from um, at the Naval Academy is going to be there, and um, another kid who was a um, PIAA champion, I think last year, um, John Stoudemire. Yeah, yeah, he's gonna, he'll be he'll be up there too. That'll be a good test for him. You know, as still the young guy getting into get into a weight class full of full of veterans for the most part. Um, like you said. It's, line open, it's kind of tough to really predetermine who's going to show up because it's such a fluid situation. Um, but from the sounds of it, we're going to have uh, to have Steve Fittery in the house, um, even though he's not wrestling for American anymore. He's going to be coming on a patch, and that's what it says on the that he's he's registered. I'll believe it when I see him in in, in Red Paul on Sunday. But if so, it's be quite a quite an intriguing matchup. Um, if he meets up with David Taylor at some point because that'll be a rematch of the semifinals last year at the NCAA Championships and I believe Taylor beat him 7-1 if my memory serves me correctly and uh, there's also as you said the kid from Clarion who's ranked number 7 he, uh, this is a big tournament for him to see some of the big time competition and also you have uh Nigel Jones from NC State, Steve Ramos from NC State, they're both you know, formidable portal wrestlers from the um, ACC that could uh, you know, really spark some, uh, spark some competition in this weight class. And then, like you said, Lewandowski from Buffalo, he had a good run last year late, and you know, it's going to be quite the competition at 165. The only thing is the number one guy, David Taylor, who doesn't seem to be smoking down and I don't, I don't see any one of these guys on the roster, including Fittery, being able to take Taylor to the than anyone. No, not yeah. from not from what he's shown us so far this year. It doesn't look like uh, anything should be very much of a problem there. But it does seem to be the weight that has the uh, most competition at it. Um, Fifty-seven also has some uh, good kids in there. James Fleming from Clarion. I saw Dirk. Was going to be in there along with Dylan, uh, Eric Hess, who seems to recovered from his battle with cancer from Lehigh. Uh, oh, yeah, he's in there. Former 65 pounder from Penn State, uh, Jay Kemmer, he's now at Lock Haven to be there. Um, Johnny Gresheimer from Edinburgh. Yeah, Kyle, yeah, Kyle John from Maryland. Uh, 157 must be pretty formidable as well. And I even saw Joey Napoli's name on there. Yeah, yeah, he's uh I saw that in there too. We'll uh, we'll see who, like I said, we'll see who shows up on Sunday. But if they all show up, fifty-seven will be quite the weight class too. And just between the Penn State wrestlers will be quite the competition. Yeah, you know, with, like you said, with all and Calvert and Bolras, that's some good competition just in the Nittany Lions singlet. And fifty-seven, you know, like they said earlier, Skimmerton did say on Tuesday that. You know, some weight classes are up for grabs, and other than 133, 141, the next one you have to look at is 157. And, and you know, you can, if Colbert has come out with a strong performance, even though he has been battling, battling an injury, he said on Tuesday that he had full intentions of wrestling. Though I think it was a knee injury he's been he's been hampered with. But if he can come out and you know, storm, storm his way to a title or something like that. Even you know, if he can get a good matchup with all and somewhere in the semis or the finals, you know, maybe Calvert can make a case for getting into the starting lineup here. So. Yeah, and the one person I was surprised not to see fifty seven, but then I saw was at forty nine was James English. So, um, do you know if he's going to wrestle? Because I know he's been battling uh, an injury. Um, I was kind of told that they were looking to give him uh, some, uh, you know, painkiller shots, some other things to try and get that uh, shoulder and neck to heal up so he could get out there. But, you know, I'm surprised to see him. They have him at 49. Yeah, I actually haven't heard about how his uh, neck is doing. I'm still going to be a little skeptical of this, skeptical until I see him out on the mat on Sunday. Um, hey, but if he's up, if he's there, 149 could be another weight class dominated by the Nittany Line wrestlers with Andrew Alton, who no one has seen since last last national championship run. Um, you know, then you got Maul Nero too. So if all three of those guys go, looks like they'll dominate the, that weight class. 
And, uh, really, other than Bingham uh, and Donnie Vincent, I don't. There's any other guys in the weight class that really are up to all in the room that knows at even English level. No, I know Seth Beth, they have him in there. A couple uh, young guys, though, to look out for. Uh, Nikki Hodgkins was a uh, PIAA champ, and um, Anthony Salupo, who's at uh, Clarion, who's had a couple good tussles with uh, Dylan Alton over the years, too. Yeah, yeah, and then also I see uh, Bones in his name down there. Oh, yeah. Uh, former State College wrestler Scott. Um, I, I believe that's Steve Bones at Cornell's. Cornell's uh, his younger brother. Pounder, his little brother, right? Yep, exactly. And, and uh, it's Scott Red, Scott's redshirting for Cornell this year, correct? Right. Okay. So, yeah, he, I mean, he's another talented wrestler who you know, could take advantage of this early season tournament as well. Well, Cornell doesn't have red shirts. They they do a deferred year, So, but that's what True. he's doing. Uh, yeah, I believe. 141 has some good guys in there. Matt ba- Bonson from... Uh, Rockhaven, I think he's ranked in the top ten right now. But uh, you know, we've got I've been interested to see what Luke Fry will do. Uh Pearsall is in there, Sherlock, Moran, Owens, and Waters. So we basically have I think uh six Penn State wrestlers in there. And then also Andrew Shute from uh, Buffalo. And um so that should be very interesting for just minimally Penn State fans to see how that all plays out. Yeah, yeah, we had your shoot there, and then uh, Kevin Smith, also from Buffalo, is oh, actually right. number 19 right now. Um, so you got, two, Buffalo is actually got, is bringing a couple good kids down here at Sunday. Um, and then also you have uh, Tanner Hall from Duke, who looks to be a dark horse in this weight class as well. And some of the stuff, though, he looks like the only Dukey that's going to be making the trip up. Um, but he's got some pretty good credentials, and he'll give, he'll give them a run for for the money. Um, and like I said earlier, 141's a pretty important weight last Sunday to keep an eye out because if he all truly isn't you know, a 141 weight right now, you know, it's wide open for that in that sense. You have Pierre Paul who, you know, has, has proved that he's, he can beat big time opponents. And then, like you said, Luke Fry, who was an outstanding high school wrestler from Montoursville, he hadn't really had a chance to to really get a good run at the 141 pound um, starting position yet. And then you also have Michael Waters, who was actually recruited to Penn State last year out of North Carolina as a 125 pounder. Yeah, and he's up two eights. Three pounder. And he's grown significantly, significantly and noticeably as well uh, into a, a 141 pounder. And I talked to Cal about it on Tuesday, and Cal said it's, if absolutely need be, Michael probably still could be 133. It's just been a little bit too hard on him consistently when 141 is just the, just as easy for him to make. Right. So, good. So there's that. And then um, the rest of the weights, though, it doesn't seem to have too much happening. But the one thing I noticed that you reported on on BWI is that uh, Frank Martellotti was going to go unattached. Now, I checked the roster. He's not registered yet, but he has to do, I know, all of that on his own and not connected to Penn State at all. Do you, do you know if that's definitely going to happen? Correct, yeah. Um, for, for everyone I talked to, you know, in the wrestling program, yeah, they're expecting Frank to, to actually, actually uh, commit himself as an unrostered wrestler. You know, they're not able to comment on him too much since he's ineligible right now and he can't wrestle as a Penn State guy. But if he goes in and wears different singlet, coached by his own coaches, and has his own, you know, paints his own way, yeah, that's that looks like the plan that, that he'll be at 133. And that's going to be exciting to see how his improvement come along since last year, because really, that, I think that fans haven't really seen him wrestle since this time last year, because he was real academically ineligible for the spring semester last year. Right. Um, he had 18 wins in the first semester last year. So it's going to be interesting Interesting to see if he's continued to improve. And it would also be nice to see him, uh, you know, go up against some of the some of the guys, like even if he can see Reaver. Um, and then I know Cornell has one of their freshmen down there that's, uh, you know, pretty solid. And you know, if he can come in and, you know, storm to the finals, maybe we can get the championship out of this. It'll give them a little bit more security to Penn State fans for 
springs the spring semester at 133 side. Well, I do know that uh, pretty much after the first semester is over, Frankie will be able to. Uh, he, he should be able to wrestle anything between that after the first semester ends and the second semester starts. So we could see him, I think, at the scuffle as well. Yeah, I think the scuffle will be the first sanctioned match that he'd be able to be eligible for if everything is continuing on the path that the brother is beating his teeth in it. Um, and then, yeah, that, that would be the first time you'd see him. But, you know, he still has to beat Reaper out for the spot, even though you know, he was leading the wrestle offs before he was ruled ineligible. Um, but the, the, the performance this weekend in any line open could earn him a starting spot come in the spring. I also saw we had uh, a couple other young guys at 33, like uh, Eric Galloway, who's a State College high school graduate. Um, uh, I think he's at uh, Pitt. Let's see, Brandon Cho, uh, Throckmorton. So there's a couple uh, younger guys that still should uh, provide some competition in there. Um, heavyweight, we've got um, another good local kid from uh, Central Mountain. Zach Coral was up at uh, Rock Haven. Um, okay. And then... And then... Uh, uh, Quintus uh, McCorkle from Clarion, and then, and then a kid uh, from uh, Michigan State, and the rest are uh, Penn State guys. So other than that, I don't see too many other um, very competitive 285 guys in there. Yeah, the biggest competition there is the Michigan State kid, uh, Joe Risquala. Cameron's had quite a few matches with him last year. Uh, you know, and, and uh, I believe they might have met at the scuffle or one other time last year. No, it was, it was actually at the duel. It was at the, the duel in East Lansing, and Rizcala actually, I think, yeah. be, beat him pretty badly. Yeah, yeah, it was at the duel last year. Um, so that, yeah, I got, from the looks of it, Rizcala is really the only guy that would provide any type of competition at heavyweight. But also, it'll be a good uh, opportunity for to keep an eye on uh, Inkrich, the second string heavyweight, heavyweight behind uh, Cameron Wade. I believe he hasn't even lost a match yet this year wrestling in the open tournaments. I know he's got two different championships at two different tournaments this year. He's he's really turning some heads in these open tournaments, and I, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing him how he, how he handles himself against some get some new faces and some new colors. Uh, let's see, 125, uh, it only looks like the only person there is Nico, and same with 84 and 97, the only real competition, I mean, is uh, is Quentin and uh, Morgan at, at th- those three weights. Correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah, 184, all I see is uh, actually Joe Rizquale's brother, I think it is, uh, John, he's at 184. I actually don't know a whole lot about his history, but, uh, you know, from the wrestling family, and, you know, he looks to be one of the you know more formidable competitors at 184. 197 it looks like Morgan's depth of competition will be uh, good old Justin Ortega and you know he's been having an outstanding season so far on the open circuit. He's, got, he's pulled in a couple championships as well. Um, 125 there is one kid there that Nico's going to want to keep an eye out on. Uh, he's registered for Army Prep by uh, Connor Utsi. He was a flow national no champ right. last year. That, that's how uh, that's how I remembered him. So you know, I've never seen him wrestle live before, or you know, uh, um, he, he wrestled. Live, but. He wrestled at the Dapper Dan, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, that might have been the kid Nico wrestled and beat him. At the Dapper Dan, that's something I have to go go back and check. That might be a possibility. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I'm not. I don't think it's going to be anyone who will threaten Nico for a championship, but uh, that will be something to keep an eye on. It'll also be interesting to see how uh, Jordan Conway does as well. well I didn't he, might be, uh, he might be Penn State's, you know, option 125 a couple of years down the road, depending on how everything shakes out. I, I didn't even see him registered, so I didn't even have him marked down. Yeah, he, uh, yeah he's, as far as I know, he's healthy and we wrestle him 125. Great. Okay, Tim, any other notes that you've got from, uh, you know, t- Tuesday Media Day that we haven't gone over? Uh, I don't believe so. I think we, you know, covered it all, but it'll be interesting to see how uh, everything goes on Sunday. We'll have some, you know, some good competition, as, as I said, and, you know, 
know, we'll see if the guys have learned from Kel's methods of, you know, the mat wrestling the past couple of weeks. We'll see how these guys do with their riding time and, you know, their escapes from the bottom, their reversals, and see what kind of improvements this they have. And it's going to be a, it's going to be tough this tournament. It'll be a long tournament, but, you know, hopefully we'll get some more answers, you know, to how this big season is going to unfold down the road. Well, it's Thursday afternoon, so I'm gonna. I got a lot to do in the next few days. I'm gonna try and get this up either Friday or Saturday morning. But um, one of the reasons is because uh, Bubba Jenkins is actually in his first MAA pro bout, and uh, I'm trying to get the interview I did with him a while back up and running. So that's another little thing, Penn State fans. If their guys out there are still Bubba fans, they may want to pay attention to. It's gonna be Saturday night and uh, his first MAA fight. Yes, sir. But Jay is um, starting the circuit on MMA. And then I also don't know if you saw this week that Shell uh, Davis, former Penn State heavyweight or 197 champion, has uh, actually got a rematch scheduled with Rashad Evans January 28th for the light heavyweight number one contender. I, I got and it then, down. I got it. I got it in the calendar already in the cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tim, that uh, wraps up, and then uh, we'll talk to you next week. Thanks for your time, man. All right, Kev. Thanks a lot for having me. Uh, we'll uh, 